It is my privilege and joy that we can start a new Bible study with the title In the Crucible with Christ. Now, at the first, this is not a real invitation for a study. It does not look like it's attractive. But we will see that according to the time we live in, it is most important. This crucible with Christ will prove for us salvation. That's why I'm looking forward to this study in which we want to come out of the crucible completely clean. Pure gold, pure silver, with no taint, with no other thing in it, just the pure element. And today we have the subtitle, The Shepherd's Crucible. Now, we live in the day when the Lord is going to come. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appears? For he is like the refiner's fire and like the fuller's soap. So evidently, we live in the days when Jesus is coming. There will be no other prolonging time. We will be the ones that finish the work. We are the ones that will see him coming either on the one side or on the other side. And the question is, who shall stand when he appears? And what does it mean to stand before him? Because, for behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yeah, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. So very evidently, there comes a day that will burn. And it will burn only the evil. Because you don't need a crucible for something that is pure. You don't need a fire except to destroy that which does not fit in. But that day also provides joy. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and he shall go forth and grow up as calls of the stall. So here is the joy of those who have been restored into the name of God. So there are two categories of humans that live in these days. Those who will be ripe for the kingdom of God and those who will be ripe for destruction. Those who are right for destruction, they have not used the grace of God in order to become free. Now, what does it mean to stand before God and what does it mean to be in the crucible with Christ? It says, And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. So there's a purpose for the cleansing uh, procedure. It's the purpose to bring offering in righteousness. That this, this procedure of purifying is needed in order to fulfill the task for what we were redeemed. So he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver. So at the end, nothing evil, nothing evil will remain in us. There is only evil that needs to be purged away. There is nothing that is, is good that needs to be burned. No. Only the evil needs to be put away. But what is that evil that must be put away? In order to understand that, we need an overview of the functions of this universe. God has created this universe in a certain type. Everything that he created is a channel. That means it works according to altruism. That means nothing can exist or function by itself. Nothing can be independent. It must take. But nothing takes in order to keep it for himself, but to do something, to give it. 
because nothing can do anything for itself. That means everything serves a purpose. That's how God created the universe. Man was created to be a servant. He should be a channel. Him was given a name, a clear identity, and a law under which he would function correctly. And this law means God as a creator is the one that gives all the means as a provider for them. And it is his active power that God gives to us, especially as humans, in order to use it for the purpose he created us. At no time we have our own resources or power. This is very basic to understand because some patients of me come and complain and say, well, uh, I have invested so much time, so much energy and power and means. I put a lot of resources into this work and look, it didn't come out well. Well, there is no need to complain. If it was not your time, if it was not your resource, if it was not your power, why would you complain for yourself? We must understand this basic truth. Every creature, starting from the first created who was Lucifer until the last, must use God's power in order to function and exist. No one except God has its own power and resources. God is the provider of everything because he is in him. He puts out everything. There is no other source than him. And we as a creature, we can at no time use the means for ourselves because they were given to put it into action and by giving it on and pass it on, it increases. And by fulfilling this purpose, complete well-being of the creature. We are only fulfilled when we are inside this law, when that what God has made to function would function accordingly. Now, there are two spheres of action regarding God and us. This is the sphere of action of God, this red lines, and this blue circle is the human sphere of action. And it's important to understand, God does not interfere in the realm of man. That is, he does not do the work of which he created man. Why would he have then created him if God should do the work that man was made for? So, let us be very clear. If God gave man a sphere of action, he leaves it to him. He cannot come into because there would be no reason why he then would have created him if God would take his work over. And on the other side, man cannot interfere in God's realm. He is limited to his own sphere. Each has its sphere of action. And that's so good to know. And that's so important that we should just keep this in mind as we go and study and especially study the crucible to see what's going on there. How is this work going to be forwarded? In Does God enter my sphere of action? Or do I have to do my job in my sphere of action? And one point more. Since everything is a channel must take in order to give, we know that everything works in a circuit. So this universe is a great circuit. And yes, it has billions of other circuits. But there is one big circuit in which everything is connected together. And it starts from God and it comes back to God, this circuit. And the question is, how many channels must be blocked so that nothing works anymore? And we know if everything works in a circuit, it is enough that one channel is blocked and the whole circuit comes to a stop or comes to a dysfunction. So a blocked channel. Now a physical channel can never be blocked by itself, it cannot block itself. It works according to how it was made. But God did not only make physical channels, he also made spiritual channels. And we have a created spirit, and Lucifer is a created spirit, and these are channels. They have an identity. And we all function according to these three characteristics. 
It is a closed system that is God cannot interfere from outside in the spirit of man. He gave the control to the spirit itself that he should do it from inside out. And the spirit is always active, never passive. So God endowed the spirit with wisdom, with understanding, so that he cannot confuse himself. But the impossible happens. The only way that a spirit could block himself as a channel was through self-deception. And this happened with Lucifer, with a third of the angels, with Adam and Eve. So they came to believe that they're gods, that they have their own resources, that they live from themselves. All this is impossible. Now they do not take the means to give them on, but they want to keep them for themselves. Everything they do is turned around themselves. So they are the opposite of that, how the universe can function. So the universe got into trouble with Lucifer, but God had a plan. And he gave this plan. He provides 7,000 years for the restoration of the functions in the universe. He sustains now in this time of grace the functions until there is a clear evidence of who wants to be a channel, who wants to be in the law of love, or who, the ones who wants to live for himself. So he gives 6,000 years for the revelation of the evil in contrast to God's love. And he gives at the same time, in this period of time, the possibility of liberation of the humans who agree with selflessness. Yes, Lucifer and his angels cannot be restored. And God did not destroy them. He leaves them and sustains them in order that it might be seen what's in their spirit, what's in them. Because it is closed only by actions. It can be made visible. And he gives 6,000 years to us grace. He invites us. He made the provision that we should be again channels. And yes, everyone must agree to be it. We must be in accordance to say, oh, yes. That's wonderful to see that the law of love is that which keeps us. Because if God cannot convince us in our reason that selflessness, love is fulfilling and not, not, not selfishness, which is the opposite of life. But if he cannot convince us, humans may remain in their deception. And then he gives a thousand years for the revelation of the judgment of the evil ones. Now, where are we in time? I hope that we all know we are at the end of the 6,000 years. There will be no prolonging anymore. God already went a little bit over in his mercy because he does not want that anyone should be lost. But as we are now in the last days, he must do a work. He must purge the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver. He needs a people that can bring offering in righteousness. And in German, it says it's the meat offering, which we read in Isaiah is the bringing of the nations, the bringing of the heathen to the house of God. That means the conversion of the heathen once. So the work cannot be finished before his people is not pure, before they are purified and there is nothing in them anymore that is unpure. So we want to go to that process, not because it is in God's intention to make harm, no. But the evil must be taken off. It's not the heat that is the problem. It's that without the heat, the evil cannot be seen and cannot be purged. It cannot be melted. 
in the, in the picture. It cannot be made obvious because it's hidden back in the heart. So what is actually the purpose of the purging? Or what is it about? Now, there are synonyms that means they are the same. To be clean is the same than to be holy. And it's the same to be righteous. And it's the same to be free. And it's the same to fear God. And it's the same with the fulfilling of the law. That means to be in the truth. That's all about it. Because a spirit can only be in the truth or in deception. Who is in the truth is clean, is holy, is righteous, is free, is God-fearing, and is fulfilling the law. So it's all about the truth. And of course, there's also the opposite, the unclean, the unholy, the unjust, the prisoner, the godless, the lawless. So it's also just one thing. They are all speaking about the same thing, that is, to be in the lie. So there are only these two ways to be, either in the lie or in the truth. And as we are all born in the lie, without the process of cleansing from the lie, we cannot come to the truth. That's why the lie must be burned. It must be cut away. It must be put on the cross. That's why God, through Jesus, is sitting there and he purges the sons of Levi so that they might do their work their work for the salvation of man on earth. This is the only work that still stays to be fulfilled, that God will show up through his people and bring the light of the truth so that everyone will have it, either for a witness or for salvation. That's why before the work can be finished, he must have purged Levites. And who are the Levites? We are, because the Bible says to us, we are a holy priesthood. We are a kingly priesthood. We were made to do offering, to do something. And we were made to bring in the heathen into the kingdom of God. But we cannot do that as long as something evil, that is, as something as a lie is within us. We only can do it when that is expelled from our lives. So what should be cleansed and tested? Whether the self-deception is still active. You see, this self-deception we are born with will not be visible except in the crucible. Because when all things are well, it looks good. In good circumstances, you might think the selfish person is a selfless one, but not in the crucible. In the crucible, you immediately will see the difference. When this crisis two years and a half began, before we saw that the Christian world is a nice place to be, we saw our brothers and sisters in the church being very active and zealous and doing good preachings and long prayers and full of uh, eagerness. But suddenly came the crisis. The crucible was put into function and immediately fear started up. Oh, he might give me the disease. Oh, I am in danger because I'm coming too close to someone who is sick. All those things reveal that it is about me. It's about us, not about God. The crucible that started two years and a half almost is a revelation. If self-deception is still active or Love is there. People, all people, will have no excuse because they can see in the crucible who they really are. And if they cannot see it, then of course there is no hope for them. The crucible brings out 
what a man really believes in his heart about himself. You see, most people do not believe that they think in, their, in themselves that they're gods. They have not understood that sinful nature has this identity, I am God. And so when I explain to some Christians that they believe that they are gods, they say, no, I never believed that. I never, I never thought that. Well, I said, yes, you don't think it consciously, but the way you behave is clear. Your disease proves it. When you get angry about your brother, you, you prove that you're a god. You prove that you believe in yourself, that you're higher than the other, that you can judge him. You prove that. So the crucible brings out what really man believes about himself. Because he might think something in himself, but the facts, his actions, prove because all actions come from either I am in the truth in my heart or I am in the lie. Either I believe the truth in my heart about myself or I believe the lie. And in the crucible, things are revealed. Now, if I am in the truth, the crucible will do me nothing because I cannot become clean or as clean. But if I'm not yet ready, then it brings it out and I have the chance to burn it away, to become pure. The crucible reveals in whom the heart trusts. Now, if you see all these three aspects are actually speaking about the same thing, because we have only one thing in our hearts, that is the self-deception. It is the belief about me, the wrong one, and it trusts the wrong person. In whom do I trust for my health? In whom do I trust for that what is coming to happen on this earth? Do I trust it in God or do I trust in myself? The crucible will reveal whose child is whom. And as long as it's grace, the crucible helps me to eliminate the evil. And when I'm free, when I'm clean, then the crucible will do me nothing. He might still be there, but he made his job. And he just will prove that the job was done well. Now we have in this first lesson of this quarter, Psalm 23. And I never understood Psalm 23 as I understand it now, as I have studied it for this lesson. And I came to the conclusion that Psalm 23 shows the completely restored man. So it is that psalm that must be fulfilled in our lives in order to finish the work. So let's prove what it means to be completely restored. In the Psalm 23, the sheep is the man and the shepherd is God or Christ. The sheep lives in complete dependence on the shepherd and the shepherd provides the sheep with everything it needs. That's the law. That's the law that we have spoken up before. That's why it must be a complete restoration because only when someone is completely restored, he is in the law of God. He means he's complete dependent on the shepherd and he does the work that he takes over in his dependency from the shepherd. So the psalm starts with the words, the Lord is my shepherd. So it's a very personal psalm. It's a psalm about me. The Lord is my shepherd. It is not our shepherd. It's my shepherd. Very clear. That means I am completely dependent on him. That is, the Lord is my shepherd. I could also say, God is my father. But here it is because David was a shepherd before he became king. He uses this, and not only him, but Christ uses in John 10 the same uh, picture of a shepherd and sheep. So the Lord is my shepherd means I am completely dependent on God. And the result of that is this clear surety, I shall not want. Why not? So how can you ever want if the shepherd provides the means and conducts the circumstances? 
How can you ever become in a one thing if you're completely dependent on the only source of all provisions, of all means? How can you ever want? It's impossible. That's why this psalm looks forward. It looks very clearly and says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. This man who says that is completely restored because he lives from God. That's why he knows, I shall not want. There will be coming difficult times, but I shall not want if the Lord is my shepherd. Now search yourself, your heart. Can you say that? I shall not want. I mean, really, in, the, in this time where inflation and, and uh, whatever comes, we don't know, it might come overnight. And we know it goes worse and worse until Jesus comes. And you are sure you shall not want? Yes. Those who have gone through the crucible will not want anything. Now he comes to prove it. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Yes, God provides the green pasture. He is the provider of the needs. What is the green pasture? It is his word. That's from what the spirit lives. But in deception, he cannot, he cannot come to the word. He might go to the words of men, to the words of science. He will be full of the scientific ideas, but not of the word of God. So God provides the needs, but I feed from the means of God. So it's me who has to take the word. So this is this clear understanding of the law. God provides. He has his sphere of action is to provide the means, but my sphere of action is to use them. If I would lay down uh, in the green pastures, like laying down and not eating from the pastures, then what will happen? Nothing. The Lord can provide so much good, so much power in his word. If we don't take it, nothing happens. And he makes me to lay down in green pasture doesn't mean I lay down not taking from that green pasture. But he makes me to have plenty. I shall not want. It's impossible. A completely restored man lives from the pasture of God. And he has all means to his disposition. He leadeth me besides the still waters. Yes, what is the water? In the Bible, God is the provider of life. It is the eternal life. It's the new life of Christ that he came to offer to the world, but I have to use it and live through it. That life that he provided, if I don't use it, it won't happen anything. And a very beautiful example is the Samaritan woman who Jesus offered his life, his water. And in the moment that the woman drank, what happened with her? She has to believe it. She believed it, and then she could not stand anymore. She had to run. She had to use that new life and go and do exactly that, what Jesus predicted to her, that there will be coming out rivers of water from her womb, from her life. That's the channel. She took from the living water, and she becomes a channel for others. God provides the life in Christ. A new being, an open channel is created, is made. But if I don't use that new life, it doesn't work nothing in me. He restores my soul. By what? God is the provider of joy. Jesus said, I came in John 10 that they should have life and life in fullness. But who has to use that joy and become happy and fulfilled? The restoration of the soul. 
happens by a co-working of the one that provides and the one that uses it. Let us understand this law one for all. It is explained in the whole scripture, but especially we can see it beautifully here. If I think he restores my soul just by his action of providing, then I will wait that my soul should be restored and it will never be restored. The soul is sustained by its own actions, but its own actions needs the power. There is no joy in me. But if I take the joy of God, I become happy and fulfilled. That's how a completely restored man looks to himself. He sees that in God, he has all things. He has been restored. And his life is fulfilled because he uses that what God has given as means. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. So who made the path of righteousness? God is the provider of justice. He made the way. Jesus says, I am the way. But he cannot walk for me on this way. I exercise it and become righteous. I don't know how, or I, I suppose that since we haven't understood the law, that's why we speak about righteousness like thinks we are declared righteous. There's no such thing. The Bible says, he who does righteous is righteous. God is the provider of justice. Jesus, in Jesus, the way, the new channel was made. But if I don't take that righteousness and use it by myself, I will never become righteous. Because it's impossible. So God made the way. I walk on it. His sphere of action and my sphere of action, they will never interfere each other. They will never be able, God, to do that, what I have to do. He provides, I cannot provide. That's his business. He provided us a means. He provided us a way to walk. And if I walk the way of Christ, if I live the life of Christ, I am righteous. It is because I fulfill righteousness, not because I am declared righteous. That's an impossibility. That's why understanding the law makes very clear. God provides. You use it. If you don't use it, you cannot be put back as a restored channel into the great circuit of this universe. Yeah, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Yes, God sees also even in darkness. And what is the valley of the shadow of death for us? Well, it is the time of trouble, the time of Jacob's trouble. It's the time going through the seven plagues. Yes, we will walk through them. It will be really dark. We won't see anything. But it doesn't matter because I am safe even when I don't see the way because I have been used to trust my God. And so even if I don't see, it's like I see. And the valley of the shadow of death can do me nothing because I'm safe. It says here in Romans 8 from 36, as is written, for, they, for thy sake we are killed all the day long we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. That will be the time in the, in the trouble. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor powers nor things present nor things to come, nor hate nor death, nor any other nature creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. How much can separate us in the time of darkness from God? Nothing. Because we are used to see him in darkness. We are completely restored into his image. And like Jesus didn't see through 
at the cross when he went to the valley of the shadow of death. So we will go through the time of trouble. We won't see through. That will be reality. But in our spiritual eyes, we know that he is there. And when he opens heaven, we will be made free from that darkness. So, we are safe in the time of darkness when we don't know where is the outcome. We know that there is an outcome because our God has a rod and a staff and they comfort me. We could also see, may say, it's a lamb that will show us the way even in darkness. And then, of course, as we have read, they try to kill us. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Yes, because we will preach a gospel that is very clear, we will be hated from the whole world. But instead of being fearful, God says, don't worry. You are secure even in adversity. And nothing can harm or damage me. Because in front of the enemies, he opens up a table. And when he opens up heaven in the seventh plague to rescue his people and to declare his righteousness and his his covenant with his faithful one. The heathen one will stand and worship at our feet because they cannot touch us. They cannot harm us. Nothing can be done unto us. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. What does that mean? We know that the oil is the wisdom through the Spirit of God. We know that without this oil, we could not become wise. But it is us that we use that wisdom and become wise. For me, this anointing is the anointing with the Holy Spirit. The anointing with the latter rain, in which we fulfill that last work that has to be done. And my cup will be not half full, but it will run over. Will the Holy Spirit use us as tools? Or will we be using the Spirit's means in our spirit so that we can finish the work? The Bible and the law is very clear. The Holy Spirit provides, but we are using it. When Solomon prayed to become wise, God gave him wisdom. But who has to use it? He used it. But in the moment he used it, he became famous and uh, became the light of the world. But as he stopped using it, or the darkness of his heart, he didn't go with God in the crucible to change everything in his heart. He left things over. And the less he used the wisdom of God, the more he became depressed and rude in his kingship. So it is us that we will use the power of God. It is us that he will help us. Yes, he guides us, but we will do the job. And that will be the greatest revelation of God's love through human being that has ever been seen in his universe until now, especially in once that in people that once were lost and now they are completely restored men. And then the psalm finishes with such a great word. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That's referring to the earthly life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's the eternal life. Yes, if he makes me his child, then as his child, I am at home in his house with him for all eternity. You see, it's normal. A child is together with his father in the house. And as he has made us his children through Christ, 
It's obvious that he will live with us. Where should we otherwise live? A family lives together. The father lives with his children. What a privilege will that be to live with him forever in his house. He created the new Jerusalem to be the house for all. What a privilege. Let us look forward to this quarter and to this study and prepare ourselves to go to whatever circumstances God brings us through. That the crucible will do its job, revealing to us that which is still unclean so that we can burn it in it. And that the crucible will prove at the end that we are completely restored. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Amen.